voice? Yes, I'm going to record my voice. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how does a cantilever work. First, what's a cantilever? It's like a diving board. It's a diving board, just like in the picture here, you know. And notice the difference. What's the difference between these two diving boards here? One's bending more than the other, right? So we're going to learn about that. Why they bend, why some bend more than others. Okay. So this is just boring stuff. Um, a lot of words. This is not the way to do PowerPoints, but what this unit is about is cantilevers, but why do we care about cantilevers for microsystems? Because they're used a lot, right? They're used all over the place. One of the, the fun things they're used for is they're used um, in chemical sensor arrays. So you can detect very small amounts of bad things in the air, for example, and they can be chemicals or they can be viruses, that kind of thing. They're also used in radio frequency applications, so they actually use cantilevers like little switches. Okay? So there's a lot of different micro applications. That that's why we teach about it, just like we taught about crystallography, because that's important to making MEMS. Cantilevers is one of the basic type of um, structures used in a lot of different applications. So I always like to tell people why we're doing it. So we're going to talk about the static mode and the dynamic mode of, how, of micro cantilevers. You guys have any idea what static and dynamic mean? What's static? It's never brought down. Static, the, the term static in general, what does that mean what, to you? What do you think about? Static electricity. Okay, what makes static electricity? Why is it static? It doesn't move. Right? It stays on a surface. You charge up the surface, it stays there. It's static. It's not moving. That's why they call it static electricity. It doesn't move. If it's moving, then it's current and, and all of that. It's called um, direct current or alternating current. Static means it's not moving. So you can use a cantilever in a way that it doesn't move, okay? And still use it as a detection device. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. What about dynamic? If static is it doesn't move, dynamic? It does move, so it's dynamic. Okay, it moves around. Now you can be static when you give a public presentation, or you can be dynamic, right? I don't know if that helps. So we'll be able to understand the differences of using um, cantilevers in a static or dynamic mode. So a switch, for example, if you close a switch, that's a micro cantilever. That would be a static use for it, right? So what is it? Well, it's a diving board. We already said that. A cantilever is a diving board. So it means that it's, it's connected on one end and free to move on the other end. So the mechanical engineers, when you say cantilever, that's what they think of, right? A beam that's connected on one end and not the other, OK? And the other technical term that mechanical engineers talk about are bridges. That's a beam that's connected at both ends, right? So the equations are a little bit different, and the way you design them is a bit different. So they're built, they can be built to be rigid, okay, like a balcony. You don't want a balcony to be too flexible, right? Or real flexible, kind of like um, a diving board, okay? So we use cantilevers and that flexing capability in applications. So transducers is, is one type of way of using it, and transducers changes one form of energy to another. And sensors, you're going to go and use it to sense something. Okay? So the more rigid a cantilever, or the more rigid cantilevers are used as a transport device for probes, Okay, or a latch. 
So if you're probing something, you don't want it to be too flexible, right? You want to be able to feel the surface. Okay. It's for probing things as well. So cantilevers are made in different shapes, right? So here we have two cantilevers that are the same shape. Same length, same width, same thickness, right? Everything's the same except what? Material. The material. Good. So if it's made out of like oak, it's going to be a little stiffer than if it's made out of rubber. You wouldn't want to use a rubber cantilever as a diving board, right? It's too, too flexible. So the material property itself um, has, a, has a component in it called Young's modulus, which is dealing with the stiffness of the material. So oak is stiffer than polypropylene in this case, which is a type of rubber, okay? So oak is five times stiffer, right? So there are lots of applications where you wouldn't want to use polypropylene. You'd want to use wood or oak because it's stiffer, okay? And they're all seeing the same force in this picture, but one's bending more than the other because one is stiffer than the other, okay? So we've got material properties, but then there's also dimensions. So this is a cartoon right here. Let's see if I can um, zoom in on this thing. Ooh, cool. All right, so here's one cantilever, here's another. They look like they're about the same thickness. What's different though? The length. Okay, now think about that. It's a shorter cantilever, stiffer than a longer one. Same material. Yes. Yeah, because of the shape. So two things, two things determine the stiffness of a cantilever. The shape and the material. Does that make sense? All right, shape and material. So that's what this cartoon is showing us, right? It's, it's saying that the, um, the length plays a role in the stiffness, okay? All right. So shorter cantilevers might be better for a latch if you want to latch something and let it like close and stay closed. You'd make a stiffer cantilever for a latching process or something that's going to latch. And you know, Sandia makes these little latching things for security reasons. There's latches used for switching. Um, lots of reasons to use a latch. Uh, on a micro scale. So you probably want to make that cantilever short, which makes it stiffer. You could change the material, but usually that costs more. If you're designing a process, if you're going to change a material in the process, it costs more. But it's easy to change the size. All right. Questions yet? You're still with me? Okay. So here's some review questions. Where would we use a short cantilever? When you want something to be stiff. When you want something stiff, yeah, like a latch. How about a long one? You want it to bend more, maybe if you're detecting something small, so it can push on it more and move it more. Okay, so in micro applications, which cantilever would be best for a latching device? 10 microns or 100 microns long? 10. Okay, if, uh, with respect to the width of the cantilever, what are two applications where one would require a narrower cantilever than another? Why would you want a skinny cantilever? Maybe. We'll find out that's not true later in the experiment. If you're trying to get inside of something, right? Probe inside. If I'm going to probe inside my water bottle, I need a skinny cantilever, right? Or go down a hole and look around in there. I'll need a skinny one. All right. So they're used in MEMS devices all the time. 
Okay, these are some of the, the different applications. Atomic force microscopes. Did you guys ever hear about an AFM? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do we use AFMs for? Yeah, you can look at surfaces and actually see the individual atoms and their structure. And I'll have to find some pictures of that. There's some really cool stuff. Um, CSAs, chemical sensor arrays. We'll talk about that in another lecture. Read-write storage devices are something called a millipede, which is pretty cool. And when I talk about cantilever applications, we'll cover that. Olfactory systems. What does that mean, olfactory? What's that mean? Any ideas? Olfactory? It's not olfactory. An olfactory wouldn't smell very good, huh? No, it wouldn't. An olfactory would not smell very good. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. Smelling. It's a system that lets you smell things. So they make something called the hound dog which is a, it's, it's a device that can smell things um, like a hound dog, very small amounts. Hound dogs are a little bit better because they can smell like 10,000 different things. This maybe only smells two or three different things, but the hound dog um, is used to detect like bad gases and things like that, like in military applications. So that's one example, and they're working on other systems. And of course, that's part of environmental monitoring, so you can use these chemical sensors and, and these um, olfactory systems and in, uh, for environmental monitoring. And then we already mentioned RF switches, so that's radio frequency switches. So you'll learn later in life if you do electronics that high frequency stuff is really hard to switch with a transistor. So they usually use a mechanical system to do that. Okay. So you can use a, um, a cantilever in static mode or in dynamic mode. Okay, so if we, if we twang, twang a cantilever, um, it, it'll vibrate in its natural frequency. Um, lots of things have natural frequencies if I tap on this, right? This is a pendulum-like system. It'll oscillate at a natural frequency, depending on the mass and the length of the pendulum. Okay, so there's, there's dimensional and material properties that determine how something will vibrate. And if you change the system, it'll vibrate differently. So if I added more weight, it might vibrate differently. Or if I made it longer, it might vibrate, vibrate differently. With a cantilever, if you add weight to it, it'll vibrate at a different frequency. So you can use that to, to measure things. Okay? Now, if it's static, if you change the load on it, it'll bend. Okay? If you change the stress on the surface, it will bend. Okay? Okay, so here you see it in static mode. You got two kids standing on a, on a set of diving boards. If we assume the diving boards are exactly the same, why does one bend more than the other? More weight. More weight. Great. More weight. So weight is a force due to gravity, right? Force equals mg. m is the mass. g is the gravitational acceleration. So this kid's got more mass, so if you multiply it by g, he's got more force or more weight than this little kid. So this cantilever will bend more, even if it's the same as this other cantilever. So that would be a, uh, an example of a static mode, okay? So if you have an external load or force or an intrinsic stress, um, it will bend. All right? But if you talk about things at a very small scale, gravity doesn't play a big role because the masses are so small. So if you, put a, if you put a virus on the end of a micro cantilever, it's not going to bend much. Right? You won't even be able to detect how much it bends. 
So you have to go to the dynamic mode to see any kind of a change. Okay? So this is a really cool picture. This is a micro cantilever. Okay, it's probably about 100 microns in length, maybe a little less, maybe 20 microns or so in width. And it has a little gold dot sitting on it. Okay, and they wanted to measure the um, mass of the gold dot. So they got this thing oscillating up and down and they measured the resonant frequency of the oscillation. And they know what it is without the gold dot and they measure the difference between having the gold dot on there and not having the gold dot. If you can measure the difference in the frequency, you know how much the gold dot weighs or how much mass it has. Okay, and I think this, in this case, um, it was six atograms. Atograms. So this is about 50 na nanometers across. So it's a pretty small dot of gold. So atto, that's, what is that? See, nano's minus nine. Pink, Pico's 12, Femto's 15, Atto is 18. 18. 10 to the minus 18 grams. So 6 times 10 to the minus 18. Not a lot of stuff, but they can measure it. Okay, and they can go even smaller now. And the reason they like gold is they can, they can design um, cantilevers and put gold in a specific spot on the cantilever. Okay? And then they can design uh, molecules that have the sulfur compounds on the end of them. So you got a molecule, the sulfur compound on the end of it, and it likes to stick to gold. Now if you can design that molecule to have other stuff stick to the other end, then you can put a coating only where there's gold, right? Sulfur sticks to gold. So I'm only going to coat the gold places. And then the other end of the molecule, I can put other stuff on there, antibodies. If I want to detect a certain type of virus, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Or maybe I'll put some other kind of um, chemical on the end that's a probe that certain target molecules will stick to. So I can look for individual molecules. And that's why we got to go small. Okay? So, you know, if you're going into engineering, this will be very familiar to you, this kind of a drawing. This shows stresses in a cantilever. Or actually, this one shows displacement. So the more red it is, the more it's moved from its original position. Okay? And they do things uh, called finite element analysis and things like that to come up with these models. So when you design a new system, you usually design it on a computer and model it. This is what engineers do all day, is they sit in front of a computer and model things. The technicians get to go into the clean room and actually make something. Some, some engineers get to make things too. We can measure very, very small displacements, okay, using a cantilever. So a 10 nanometer displacement, that's pretty small, okay? They can actually go smaller than that now. You mentioned the atomic force microscope, right? You can see individual atoms are about one or two angstroms in size. So they can actually measure very small displacements. Cantilevers are great sensors. Okay, we'll talk about that. We'll have some more pictures. There's a, there's a type of cantilever with a more of a coating. So you see Let's see if we can zoom in on this thing a little bit better. You see this thin layer here, that's the gold that I was telling you about before. Then you put a sulfur compound on there with a different end on the molecule so you can coat the top with whatever you want. Okay, and then you can t detect individual things. The other thing you can do is coat it with a material that adsorbs things specific thing or changes as a result of something. So let's say I put a coating on here, this green coating, 
And let's say it gets longer, it wants to expand if, if I put it in an acidic environment, pH, right? And I've just made a pH sensor, right? So if this green coating wants to expand, what's going to happen to my cantilever? If you have something... A, yeah, the green wants to get bigger, so the cantilever is going to want to bend, right? So that's really cool. If your cantilever, let's see, if your cantilever wants to bend because you've got this coating on it, let's see if I can get green. Okay, so I got some green coating on here, right? The green coating wants to get longer, okay? So it wants to get a little bit longer. It's stretching. So in order for it to get longer, the red part has to bend. All right? It's like a surface of a ball. The further away you are from the surface, the more it's bent. So it's going to want to bend. So if it gets longer, it's going to want to bend in that direction. If I can measure the amount of bend, I made a sensor. So you see how that kind of works? And that's static mode. Okay. That's interesting. I can get rid of that. All right. So you can put a probe coating on a cantilever. It's sensitive to a certain chemistry, certain environment, and then you can look look for a change in the in the bending of it and you know if you've detected something. Okay? See what that's showing you. So here's another example, okay? You have a surface, right? It's got a certain type of probe on it. Only these purple balls stick to it. Those are the analytes, the target molecules you're looking for, okay? So if these things are in the environment, they'll stick to the surface and change the way the surface acts, okay? Uh, there we go. And they'll bind. And only the ones you're looking for will bind to this surface. Anything else out here won't because it doesn't have the right chemistry. Okay, so you can make it very specific. Gravity doesn't play a role on the small scale. On the big scale it does. Okay. So again, here you see as close up, right, as the molecules in this case start to get an adsorbed, not absorbed, it's called adsorbed because it's on the surface, A-D-S-O-R-B, adsorbed. Um, as the molecules start to bind on the surface, you can see they're trying to push the green ones further apart, right? So it's wanting to expand in this example. So you can see that the cantilever is starting to bend. Okay, so how do we measure the bend of a cantilever? Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. All right. Now, how many of you have ever seen an old thermostat? Looks like a coil. The way they work is they're actually two different metals. You've seen one. Exactly. So, um, so the old thermostats were based on a coil, right, with two different materials that are together. So it's usually brass and something else. I can't remember the other metallic. But brass and whatever it's adhered to expands at a different rate with temperature. So one expands more than the other. So if I heat this thing up, it'll want to uncoil, get bigger. Okay? So what happens is this end will move depending if it gets hotter or colder. Okay? So if you have a little meter on the end, right, it'll move hotter or colder, and that's your thermostat. 
right? So you, you turn this whole coil, if you turn the whole coil, it's metal, you can have it turn on and off at a certain temperature. Very simple. Okay, and a lot of thermostats are still built on that. Bimetallic system. So each, each metal has a different coefficient of thermal expansion, right? That's a big word, but it's a simple idea. Coefficient of thermal expansion. So that's how much it expands for a certain amount of temperature change. Some things expand more than others. And if you put two, two different materials together that have different thermal expansion coefficients, they'll expand at different rates. And as a result, you'll get stress where those two materials are, are connected together, and it'll bend one way or the other. And that's, that's how it works. And you can do that on the molecular scale with um, different types of uh, materials. So you can have an example where these um, analytes that you're trying to find can combine with the surface and cause it to contract. Then it'll bend up, right? Because this is trying to be smaller than this end. So it'll bend up. It's trying to expand that coating. Then it wants to be longer so it'll bend down in this picture. Right? It's trying to stretch down. We can measure displacement with a laser. And that's how the atomic force microscopes work a lot. They, they come in with a laser beam and bounce it off the end. And we have a nice video of that that I'll show you next time. Okay, so you can bounce lasers off of it. And if this bends, what happens to the reflected beam? It changes. Yeah, it's a different angle. It reflects at a different angle. So if you have a position-sensitive um, device out here, right? Position, what do they call it? Position-sensitive detector, PSD. Okay? If your reflection is here, you measure that position. If it bends more, the reflection will be down here. And this detector will tell you what position it's in. Now what's cool is if you move it kind of far away, kind of far away, very technical term, right? You'll get more amplification, right? And we can play with that. We've got some mirrors and cantilevers, so we can show you you know, if you move it a little bit, you see a little bit of motion in the reflected spot, but if you move the spot further away, it's a bigger displacement. Okay? All right, so... Um, so you measure the angular deflection. Okay? Good. All right, so we can measure displacement with a laser. We can also measure it electronically with resistance. So you can put what they call a piezo-resistive element on the end. It's basically a wire, right? So if I put a wire here on the end of my cantilever, if I bend the cantilever, these wires will stretch, right? Does that make sense? They'll want to stretch. Right? If you look at the side view, here's my cantilever. Here's my wire. And then if I bend my cantilever, this wire wants to stretch, right? Well, if the wire stretches, it changes its electrical characteristics. Okay? And you can measure that electronically. So there's different ways of getting these cantilevers um, to work and there are different ways of detecting how much they move or how much they bend. And as a result, you can make a wide variety of different kinds of sensors. So here's a cartoon again of a whole sensor system. Right? So this is pretty easy stuff. We code it. Coat the cantilever with something that likes whatever we're looking for. And this is our environment of stuff. So if we're looking for these little green guys, 
We make a coating that only green guys stick to, okay, the green molecules. So if this sensor array, which has a different coating on each, each cantilever, if it detects the green guys, that one will bend or vibrate at a different rate. If you're dynamic, it's vibrational. If you're static, it's just bending. And then you'll know when you detected something because the laser beam is reflecting at a different angle. Okay? So you can take the output of your precision sensitive device, put it in through some signal processing, and then get an output on a computer screen that you can read. Okay? This one's coded differently, this one's differently, so you can, you know, code it for each different type of material you're looking for. And then you know if you've detected something, depending on which one of these bends. Simple concept. Okay, dynamic works by vibrational mode. So as things vibrate, okay, you can, um, you can see a change in the vibrational mode if the environment is changing it for some reason. In micro cantilevers, usually the vibrational frequency will change if you add some mass to it. Okay, so you can read through the notes later in the written material. This is a really cool picture. I want to explain this one to you so you can get an idea what you're looking at. Does anybody know what type of picture this is? No idea? Does this help? It's a scanning electron microscope picture. So we can take movies with it too. But what they did here is they took one image, like a camera, took a snapshot, and look at this right here. See this thing here? It's blurry, right? We're going to do the same thing in class with our cantilevers. Sandia calls this a blur envelope. Okay, so even if it's moving really fast, you can tell it's moving if you take a slow picture because it'll look blurry. All right, so this is a blur envelope. And we'll take some pictures and you'll see what that means later. But Sandia does this on a very small scale because then they can tell what the resonant frequency is of this cantilever because they drive it at different frequencies until they see it oscillating at a big envelope, right? That means you're at resonance. That means you're driving it at the resonant frequency. So we're going to do some of that. You're going to break some things. Uh, maybe we can find some meter sticks we can break later on by driving it at resonant frequency, okay? So if the resonant frequency changes, either the, the dimensions changed or the materials changed, but if you don't change those two things, another reason is you add some weight to it or some mass to it, it'll also shift the resonant frequency. Okay, so think of a thought experiment, right? A baby bounces on the end of a diving board, boingy, 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 right, kind of fast. Now, if the baby's father goes on the diving board, is it going to bounce faster or slower? We know that naturally, right? We've probably done that in swimming pools, okay, or stand on the end of a, a beam and try to get it to bounce, okay? So we do have this animation on YouTube. We'll go there later and, and watch it, okay? But, you know, it shows this kid is on the end of a diving board and he's bouncing kind of fast. And then in the next scene, the father comes in, saves the baby, but the freak gets slower. So this is the math. This is the hardest part of this lab. Okay? But it's not that bad. Okay, so... This K, we call the spring constant. The M is the mass of the system. Okay? And this thing that looks like a funky W, that's a Greek letter. It's omega. That's the natural frequency. 
That's where it wants to vibrate. So K is the stiff, stiffness and M is the mass. And this is a classic harmonic oscillator equation. You'll see that in physics later on when you're at the upper levels. If you go on to engineering or if you become a technician, you'll see this equation on, a, on occasion. Okay? So you can just look at this and see right away that if K gets bigger, what happens to the omega? It gets bigger. All right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right? It's stiffer. K is the stiffness. Make it stiffer, it's going to want to vibrate more. And we'll show that. We'll do a hands-on experiment to show that. If we add some mass to it, right, what do you think will happen to omega? Decrease. It'll decrease. Bigger number in the denominator, smaller number overall. And then you might say, you know, what, what's this... Um, Erase some of this stuff. What's this K actually made out of? What does it look like mathematically? Okay, this is the spring constant. It looks like a mess, doesn't it? There's a lot of letters in there. But it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so I'm going to draw, try to draw a nice picture of a cantilever. Use my finger. Try to, ugh, that's not working. All right, here's your cantilever. So this is L, this is width, and then this is how thick it is. All right? Thickness. So that's what you see in this equation here. Right, you've got thickness right here. You've got the width. You've got the length. Right, so the geometry has something to do with the stiffness. Remember, we said when it was shorter, we'd expect the stiffness to be higher or lower with a shorter cantilever, shorter, higher. It's a little stiffer. Right, a short plank off the pirate ship is stiffer. So that's the, that makes sense with the math because if L gets bigger, right, it's in the denominator, so it makes the whole fraction smaller. So there the width increases You would think. If K is bigger, it's stiffer, correct? Yes. It's not as simple as you would think because you've got this M here. So it'll end up canceling each other. You've seen this before. He did it with Steve this uh, summer. Good. Right? So the thickness, though, is cubed. So if we, if we make it a little thicker, you know it's going to get stiffer, and you've probably, probably felt that or seen that. Right? A really thin branch is flexible. A thick branch is stiff. Okay? So you've got this thing where you have geometry, right? And then you've got this other weird thing right here, this E. Well, that has to do with the material. So if it's steel, it has a different E. If it's wood, it has a different E, right? If polypropylene has a different E. So steel is stiffer than rubber, so the E is going to be bigger. Right? Because you end up with a stiffer spring. Okay? It's a spring constant. So E is called the Young's modulus of elasticity. It's also known as the bulk modulus. So you'll see it referred to in two different ways. Okay? But again, this is, this is a, a property of the, of the spring, stiffness, and it's a combination of the material and the dimensions. And with resistance in electrical, it's the same thing. You've got resistance is equal to the material, resistivity times the length over the area of the wire. So it's also geometry, material property. So these, these things aren't that complicated when you break them down. Okay?
So I want you guys not to be scared of equations that look kind of complicated. They're not really that once you break it down. So the Young's modulus is, is of elasticity is that uh, E number, right, right here. And here are a couple of examples. And they're in a weird unit called gigapascals. Giga is 10 to the what, ninth? All right, pascals is a pressure unit, newtons per meter squared. So it's a pressure unit. It's kind of weird. It's a material property, and it's measured in pressure. But that's how the units work out. So fear not. It, that does make sense. OK, so you can see rubber is pretty flimsy, right? Real low E. Probably propylene's a little higher. Oak is much higher. Aluminum is even higher than oak. And then polycrystal and silicon, which is what we like to work in, in MEMS world, is 160. But some people are working with diamonds. OK? So diamonds can, OK? They can be very, very stiff, diamonds. Um, 10 times stiffer. No, not quite 10 times stiffer than, than crystalline silicon. So a lot of people like to work with diamonds for that reason. OK, so what do you think? If something has a higher mass or a lower mass, uh, if, it, if you lower the mass or higher the mass, what happens to the frequency? Perfect. So lower mass, faster oscillation. You'll do the experiment today just by observation. Uh, short cantilever or long, what do you, would you expect? Short gives you the higher one. Good. Which yields a higher frequency, a thin or a thick? Trick question. It's a trick question. From the math, which you saw before, the, the width, um, the width was, um, um, oh, this is thin and thick. OK, the width doesn't play a role, but the thickness does play a role. OK? And then wood and metal, we just looked at that. Right, that was the previous slide. The wood had a lower E than the metal. OK, and E is in the numerator. OK, there are the answers. OK. So an application would be a micro um, chemical sensor array. Let's zoom in on that puppy and see what it looks like. So here we see a bunch of um, cantilevers, like in that other picture. But now we've added the molecule sitting on top. This one likes to stick to it, okay? but only to this type of molecule. So now you've made a sensor. So when, we, when this molecule comes by, it sticks to that molecule. It adds mass to the system. So if you add mass, it's like making the the guy on the end of the cantilever come out and add to the weight of the diving board, it's going to vibrate a little bit differently, right? Probably slower. OK? So the more the frequency shifts, the more molecules we detected. And then we've got a YouTube video on that we can show you later. OK, we can use it for an atomic force microscope. Okay, this is a cartoon of how that works. So in static mode, the, um, the cantilever just sits on top of the surface, and as you move the sample back and forth, this goes up and down. We do have a dynamic mode for this. Okay. And the way that works is you get this thing oscillating, so it's tapping, tap, 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 tap. And you look at the vibrational range as it's tapping along the surface. Okay? So you can use dynamic or static mode with an atomic force microscope. So they've done both. The common way now, I think, is in tapping mode. Okay? I'm going to skip that. So an atomic force microscope has a, a pretty small spring constant. 
Okay, about 0.1 newtons per meter. Okay, the slinky is, is um, about 10 times stiffer than that. Okay, so these are pretty flimsy, but they have to be if you're going to map out the surface. So some food for thought. How are macrosized cantilevers similar to microsized cantilevers? Yeah, they could have the same function. They're connected on one end, yeah. right? How are they different? Well, they can oscillate faster. Yeah, they're smaller, they work faster, there's less mass, right? They resonate at a higher frequency. Okay, and then what causes it to bend? A couple of things. That coating? Yeah. So it wants to compress or it wants to expand. It can cause it to bend. Analytes. Yeah, the analytes get adsorbed. That's with AD, S-O-R-B, adsorbed. Um, and then it can either cause that coating to want to expand or contract. If it contracts, it tends to bend up. It wants to make the coating less lengthy than the cantilever. So you're going to bend it up towards the coating. And if you want, if it expands, then that coating wants to be longer. Okay, it's done. So, in summary, cantilevers are used in a lot of MEMS applications. That's why we teach about them in this class. And you'll learn about harmonic oscillations, which is key and fundamental to physics, chemistry, and, um, and uh, engineering. So the concepts in there will take you far. You'll understand them. Um, so that's the other thing. It helps your STEM education. STEM, what's that stand for? Yeah, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, right? So if you can get a, any kind of diploma in, in that area, you will probably find a job. Okay, so, you know, and we like cantilevers and microsystems applications like Things like um, sensors, uh, or sensor arrays, atomic force microscopes, micro switches, needles. Ooh, needles are cantilevers, right? They're only connected on one end. And probes, like the atomic force microscope probe. Okay, so there's a lot of different uses for cantilevers on the micro scale, and that's why we like to teach about it. Okay, and that's all there is.